Welcome back. I'm Tedward, and today, thanks to Bond Group in Waltham, Massachusetts, we're driving a 2002 BMW E46 M3. It's got a 3.2 liter inline six cylinder with individual throttle bodies that puts out 333 horsepower straight to the rear wheels. This is probably my favorite generation of M3, despite it not being the best at really anything. There's more powerful M3s out there, and there are lighter M3s out there, but this car is still kind of the embodiment of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now they do come with stories and this car in particular actually has a very weird true crime story attached to it. But first, being a 2002, the early cars, 01 and 02, tended to suffer rod bearing failures more than the later cars. And this one actually had an engine replacement in 2004. The car, the chassis has 77,000 miles on it now, but this engine was replaced. And presumably an engine coming from 2004 is probably a little more reliable than that of the O2. But I think a lot of people only ascribe the rod bearing failure symptoms to the E92 with the S65 V8. And everybody goes and does the rod bearing replacement on that car. But not to be forgotten, the S54 in this E46 M3 suffers the same fate more often than you'd think. Style-wise, I think this was the end of an era. This is before everything got really bulbous and ugly. And what I love about the E46 M3 is that it's kind of like a wide body version of the E46. Everything just kind of juts out and sticks out a little more. And back in the day, back in the early 2000s, this was the kind of car that could really slip under the radar because you wouldn't notice it was anything special unless you were actually a BMW fan. The M3 obviously got special bumpers, the quad tipped exhaust, but man, these like bullet shaped mirrors I also have those on my M5 really do the trick. But on the M3, they do not automatically fold like they do on the M5. So that is one of those lower end features that you only get on the M5. Gluing it to the road is a 225 section tire up front, a 255 section in the rear. We're not dealing with massive amounts of torque, but we do have about 3,400 pounds to haul around. So you do need a bit of meaty rubber to keep it stuck in a corner. Let's take a quick look under the hood before we get into this gorgeous interior. Lifting up this hood, there's our S54. And I've seen this engine in just about everything. Everybody loves to S54 swap all of the things. And this is a great engine to pop into an E36 chassis or even an E30 chassis if you're really ambitious for a fun track car. This is when the M division was making proper like racing engines for the street. You can see those individual throttle bodies. You've got variable valve timing with the Vano system and it revs to 8,000 RPM, it takes 10 W60 and you've got to let that oil warm up just a bit before you really start thrashing it. One of my favorite features of the E46 M3 are these opening rear glass. That's so cool and I think it makes the car just feel so special and properly European. In the back, we do have seating for three, two mildly comfortably, three probably very uncomfortably but there is reasonable space back here it's not horrible you can put a couple adults not too tall in the rear and you know everything's covered in leather it's a comfortable place to be you've got your ski pass right here and an armrest but no cup holders you were lucky you even got them up front the interior of the E46 is fairly timeless, aside from the fact that you get a CD changer, but not having the upgraded navigation system in this car is now a blessing because you don't have that awkward small screen with the junky DVD-based navigation that barely works. And you gotta pay big money if you wanna update that navigation system, so it's not even worth having unless you just want the prestige of proper in-period luxury items. The interior of this car has been done over just a little bit. So all these trim pieces, which normally they bubble up and they fade and they get all gross and sticky and nasty. Uh, the owner of the car now actually went through and resprayed this. So all these trim pieces look brand new, which is really a treat when you jump in the car. So let's start up this raspy S54 and go for a drive. love the sound of this engine. This is the classic BMW rumble that got me into BMWs. You hear that low bassy tone at idle. To me, that always symbolized proper German motoring. Thankfully, this car is equipped with the six-speed manual gearbox. You could get this car in SMG2, which was the sequential manual gearbox 
from BMW. The first SMG1 came out in the European E36 M3, and then uh, maybe a couple other models, but that's how I know it. And then the M5 and the E60 generation got SMG3. Luckily, converting SMG2 to a manual, not that difficult because it actually uses the exact same gearbox. So basically you need to just re-engineer it a little bit and add a clutch pedal. It's more complicated than that, but my friends down at Wild Motorsport do that swap all the time. And it's nice because you don't have to go source another transmission. So let's go out for a drive and talk about how this car ended up on Dateline. Love, love, love that sound. Not everybody loves that sound. To me though, that raspy, high-pitched metallic sound is just phenomenal. And while these brakes aren't anything to really write home about, they do the job. They're not like some massive monoblock six-piston calipers. They're really simple looking, but they have just enough bite with a fairly aggressive pad compound for the time. And, you know, yes, on a racetrack, they're gonna overheat. You've gotta put some beefier brake fluid in them to make sure you don't like fade away and let that pedal sink to the floor. But for normal street use, you'll be a-okay getting through some high-speed stops. It's important when you drive these cars to make sure they're up to temperature. So if you're looking down here, we've got two temperature gauges, obviously an oil temp gauge in the tack and then a water temp gauge right here. There's two dots on each gauge. You wanna make sure that that oil temp gauge especially is between those two dots before you start redlining the thing. These seats are so supportive. The steering is so like light but connected. It's really special. There's something really cool about this car that makes it feel like a luxury car and a very sporty car at the same time. They basically invented like the sport sedan or at least perfected it in my opinion. This is when BMW really had the secret sauce. Now it's not like a drag race car, you know? This gearbox, while precise and, and fairly satisfying to row gears in, it's not like getting in a Camaro and just rocketing through gear to gear to gear. You've gotta be a little bit sympathetic and a little more sympathetic than I think most Americans were driving these cars, which is why I think a lot of these ended up with pretty worn synchros and rough times ahead on the second hand market when it comes to E46 F3s. But if you got a good car that had an owner that cared for it and was patient enough and understood, you know, mechanical sympathy, you're gonna be A-OK. -okay. Now this sport button, really all it does is sharpen up that throttle response. It does not add any power. It doesn't even change the steering weight, I believe, on the E46. In the M5, the E39, that sport button did two things. It changed the throttle response, the mapping, and it changed the weight of the steering, but not in this car. This car, just the throttle, and without the sport button on, it can be a little trickier to rev match because you've got to dig deeper into that pedal and it's slightly more non-linear. The name of the game with these cars is to keep the revs up because there's not a lot of torque. It all kind of starts coming together after about 4,500 RPM, but man, way up top is where the magic sits. By today's standards, this car is fairly small, honestly. It was a, a mid-sized sedan back then, or a coupe back then. And 
on the highway, it's so stable. I mean, that's where part of that weight comes into play because being 3,400 pounds, it doesn't feel insignificant, which means that you really could do your Autobahn burning at 150 miles an hour and just cruise without much concern. It's gonna be stable at that speed. And man, it's been a while since I've driven a nice one of these. I mean, I've driven some okay cars in my day, but these are getting a little old. And so worn suspensions, bushings, all that stuff add up to a much more sloppy experience. And I've got to say, this car has had the maintenance done. It feels fantastic. This one is like as close to new as I felt in quite some time. Okay, so why is this a Dateline car? Well, this car was on the news. A man named Fotis Doulos was accused of murdering his wife, Jennifer Doulos. And I, and I don't want to tell this story as like a sensational thing. This is just factual. I'm not, I'm not trying to be one of those true crime porn people. You know, it's just an unfortunate tragedy. Um, and he was accused of murdering his wife. And when he was formally charged... They never found her body or anything, but they did find some evidence to suggest that he had involvement in this murder. He was charged, and two days later, while under house arrest in Hartford, Connecticut, he was found trying to kill himself. They, they, he survived the suicide attempt and died in the hospital two days later, but they found him with carbon monoxide poisoning in his garage, and there's helicopter footage of this car just outside the garage, it appears. And, uh, yeah. Just the right amount of like balance and precision that you really love to see from your German automobiles. I mean, it is just unbelievable how entertaining this is still to drive in 2022. Ease of driving, man. That's the nice thing about these M3s. They are usable, sort of dailyable cars, and this is one of those cars that really strikes that balance between being like a sporty thing and an outrageous like track monster. Of course, there's going to be some body roll, like you know, a lot of people do insane work to these cars to make them their track day toys. But you really can just take it out and go enjoy it. I mean, it's balanced; it'll slide properly. And look at that—that that screwdriver still sitting in the middle of the road after that Murcielago video, huh? So while everything is like psycho, psycho, psycho fast these days, everything's turbocharged with torque from like 1200 RPM, this car is a properly naturally, uh, proper naturally aspirated monster that really requires the driver engagement to keep it moving properly, right? Like if you if you didn't get your shift right, you you stayed in too tall of a gear, your corner exit is gonna be really slow because you don't have the torque to claw your way out from like 3,000 RPM. Really easy to just hit all your rev matches nicely. I love the throttle mapping. And the visibility out of this M3, I mean, it really like rivals a 911 for being a nice cabin where it's a sports car that doesn't restrict your vision. Like it's really frustrating when you get into sports cars and you basically can't see anything out of them. And that's like, an, oh, what a cool little MR2, man. I still never driven one of those. It's really great to be in a car that promotes visibility, that promotes drivability, while also being outrageously fun and, uh, you know, mildly exotic with this engine. Oops. 
I can see why this became one of those cars that a lot of teenagers wrecked hard when they came out because it's it 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 wants to be thrashed. It like it really wants to be driven hard. And if you don't have the self-restraint to not drive 80 miles an hour down residential streets, well, chances are you're either going to get arrested or you're going to find your way into a telephone pole at an alarming rate of speed. Now, the first time I was ever in an E46 M3, I believe was in 2005 or 2004. Yeah, it was 2004 because I had just got my learner's permit. I was 16 years old. And this girl that I was friends with, I was over her house and her dad drove me home one night and oh my goodness, he had a brand new E46 M3. And I think, I could be wrong, I'll put like a disclaimer on the bottom. I wanna say the, the MSRP on those cars, these cars were like $64,000 at the time. And I was like, holy cow, who can afford $64,000? This girl's dad is rich. Um, it was black and he took me for a ride and I remember being in the passenger seat at night going through my like little rural town and he went wide open and I just, it, it blew my mind. It really, it genuinely felt fast and it was a sound that I had never heard and I knew that I needed a BMW. I knew that BMWs were for me. That's one of the things that really locked in BMWs for me as a teenager. And I ended up buying an E39 M5 and subsequently an E92 M3 but I'll tell you what, the brand is nowhere near what it was at that time. And maybe that's fine. Maybe it evolved beyond me. You know, sometimes things grow up away from you. You know, it's like being in a relationship where you grow apart. No one's at fault, but you're just different people. And I feel like with BMW, we are, we are not in the relationship that we started at. such a good car man it's just such a good car this is really satisfying to row through the gears it's really satisfying to operate and just feel like you are in control of this little beast and it's the right size this is how big cars should be i can't believe cars got so big the e46 m3 is the correct size car and i'll stand by it Trash control in these cars, a bit sensitive. You could, you could feel it kind of step in a little bit as I was pushing through that corner. You know, and it's frustrating because it's like, you know it's unnecessary. You know that like the amount of slip that was gonna happen in that scenario was not devastating. So you're like, Ugh. you know, so one of the things that I always do in my M5, I, I always turn off trash control. But in other people's cars, I usually just leave it on because you know, sometimes you just don't know what's gonna happen and it's not worth wrecking on video. Even though it may be getting a lot of views, I don't want to answer to somebody that I've wrecked a car. So, this thing really does still scratch the itch, which I think is a nice way to conclude a visitation with the E46 M3. They're so expensive now, but the bubbles may be uh, deflating a little bit. Maybe we're getting to a point where these cars will become slightly more affordable, but in like perfect spec, you know, you want like a, a, like a zero mile car, they're gonna cost you insane amounts of money. But like this car, I think there's that sweet spot where it's been taken care of, it's got two owners. The second owner has all the records and is taking care of it. And it's tight as a drum, man. It's nice to drive a really tight little M3. Share your E46 M3 stories below because I really think because there were like there was like 80,000 of these made, I think. I really think because there were so many of these made, a lot of folks got into BMWs in the early 2000s basically because of this car. A lot of people got into it with the E36, but this was the real true M3 in the United States since the E30. 
because the E36 did not get the full shebang that Europe got. Not even Canada. We got kind of a neutered E36 M3. This E46 is the real deal. It is proper M division stuff. Thanks so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Don't forget to respect the drive, and I'll see you in the next one.